Hi, everybody. My name is David Walker. I'm the director of the Shasta Cascade Small Business Development Center. Welcome to our one-hour webinar with the uh, Small Business Administration and a panel of local business leaders uh, to talk to us about uh, their experiences, especially in these current times. And uh, without going into too much, I, I would like to say that the SBDC is um, a nonprofit that's funded by the SBA and the state of California in our case. And we provide uh, no cost advising and no cost webinars like this one uh, that, are, that are paid for through your tax dollars. So thank you for paying your taxes. Keep paying your taxes and we'll keep putting these on, I suppose. Uh, but at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, David Castaneda from the Small Business Administration. He's gonna give us an update as to what they're doing and uh, some of the things going on with uh, uh, COVID-related help that's available to small businesses. And then we'll uh, have a panel of uh, some of our local leaders. So it's all yours, Mr. Castaneda. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walker. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Castaneda. I'm with the U.S. Small Business Administration. We are a federal agency. Uh, so uh, our uh, agency is in every state in the United States, and, and we're also in Puerto Rico and Guam. Uh, every county in the United States is covered by our services and programs. And again, we'll go over the uh, programs that we have on this uh, presentation. Um, so the, there's four parts to the SBA. Uh, the first part that we're gonna look at is our economic relief or disaster aid and assistance programs that we have. And currently uh, the SBA still has ongoing uh, uh, openings in use for our economic injury disaster loan. We call it the EIDL loan. So individual sole proprietors, small businesses can still apply for this. Even if you're just you alone in the business, you know, you're a single sole proprietor, you still can apply for this direct loan from uh, by the federal government, the SBA. So the way this works, um, and again, you would have to have been in business prior to this being enacted, which was uh, in March of this year, okay? So you'd have to be in business prior to that. Um, so this uh, particular loan program uh, for for-profit businesses, uh, once you do get the loan, let's say you apply for the loan and you get the loan uh, to keep your business up and running, um, you have 11 months before you have to start making payments on the loan. And then once you start making the payments, the interest rate for a for-profit business is at 3.75%. And you have 30 years to pay it back, which means once you start paying it back after the 11 months, every month you make a payment and that is stretched out over a 30 year period, okay? Uh, if you're a nonprofit, um, nonprofits also can apply for this uh, direct loan from the federal government. The interest rate is at 2.75%, um, but everything else still uh, pertains. So once you get the funds, you get 11 months before you have to start paying it back. And then um, after that, you pay it back on a month to month basis over, over a period of 30 years. Okay, so that is up and going available. And again, if you need help applying for this, you're not sure how to do this or the paperwork, we do have free assistance again through the SBDC. Um, you can contact uh, the local SBDC there in Reading. Um, Mr. Walker has consultants that can help you uh, to, to uh, get through this. Now, some individuals, uh, business owners may have already applied for the Paycheck Protection Program. As you can see, that did close on August 8th, but a lot of small businesses are now uh, doing the forgiveness part of it so they can get that loan forgiven, okay? Again, if you need assistance with this, um, we uh, encourage you to connect with your local small business development center, uh, our centers, SBDC centers have received additional funds to help individuals uh, get through this and get assistance they need to help them through this, okay? So again, the uh, EIDL loan, which 
is right here. That is still up and running. So if you still need assistance, that program is still running and available for you. If you have received the Paycheck Protection Program, you need help with the loan forgiveness part of it. Um, again, the SBDC, Small Business Development Center, can help you with it. Now, every year, the SBA also helps businesses that have been um, uh, that if there's been disasters in their local community, for example, in California, forest fires, the wildfires that have hit in a lot of our communities. So those are still uh, being uh, done by the SBA. Okay, so uh, every year it, it could be hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, earthquakes, things like that. Uh, we're still doing those type of uh, disaster loans and those are still available. Those loans, though, are only if your particular county is declared in a disaster uh, declaration through the SBA. Okay, so it does have to be declared as a disaster area through the SBA before you can then apply for that particular disaster loan, uh, whether it's physical uh, damage to your business or economic uh, damage. So we do have uh, various, various types of loans that you can get, um, but it does have to be declared a disaster. And normally uh, the, uh, the SBA sends out um, newsletters uh, in, into your community. The local news usually puts it out and you'll usually see where SBA, normally they have uh, locations there with SBA personnel on the ground helping individuals apply for these loans. Okay, so that is still ongoing. So again, the first area of the SBA is our disaster assistance. There's four different areas. Now we're gonna cover, um, oh, before <laughs> we go into that, um, this is our SBDC Finance Center. And Dave Walker's uh, office works with this SBDC Finance Center that covers Northern California hand in hand. So basically, if, if you need help, some may, maybe some of you listening might not be in Northern California. Maybe you're sometimes from different states because now with webinars, you can listen from pretty much anywhere. Um, but this is for Northern California. If you are interested in getting help, with applying for a loan or for the forgiveness part, you can connect with our SBDC Finance Center at loans at asksbdc.com. Um, Dave Walker, they work close hand in hand with this center all the time. So they're, they're very um, connected with them. Also, if you're a nonprofit, we do recommend that you work with a women's business center because the women's business center that is also funded by the SBA has given additional funds again, to help nonprofits with either applying for these economic relief loans or helping them with the forgiveness part of the loan. Okay, so that's through the Women's Business Center. Okay, so the second part of the SBA program. So there's four parts. The second part is our normal loan programs to assist entrepreneurs either starting a business or if you're a small business owner, you wanna learn how to expand and grow your business. These are our ongoing programs that we have all the time. So the first uh, program we have is our microloan program. So the microloan program is where SBA works with a local nonprofit lender. So these nonprofit lenders run the SBA microloan programs for us. So they have funds that the SBA gives to them. So those nonprofit lenders can lend out into the community. Those loans are from $5,000 to $50,000. What's neat about the microloan program is they could also help the borrower or the applicant with different things. For example, they can help them with the business plan, helping them put all their financials together. And they're also a little bit more lenient on credit scoring when it comes to looking at your credit report. So for example, in the, in the local uh, Northern California area. Um, our particular office is in Sacramento. Um, we do have a nonprofit lender that covers the greater Sacramento area and they're called Opening Doors. And again, they cover um, pretty much the seven counties around Sacramento. Now, here's the thing. If there's not a uh, local micro lender in your area, um, the state of California also has a microloan program. And when you connect with the SBDCs, 
a lot of times the the um, consultants that you work with know about not just SBA programs, but a lot of other programs that are available and help you plug into those. So that's the value of working with the SBDC consultants. Okay. The next program we have is the 7A loan program. And this one, again, is one of the best programs SBA has. It's widely used throughout the United States and in California. This is a partnership between the SBA, which were federal, and the private sector lenders. For example, national banks, community banks, and credit unions we work with. Uh, so a national bank could be, for example, Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, um, Chase Bank. A community bank could be Banner Bank, Tri-County Bank, uh, Bank of Stockton, uh, a credit union, um, one in our uh, greater Sacramento area, Safe Credit Union, that's very active in these loans. So the way it works is you, the borrower, would go to one of these lenders. Now, we got hundreds of these lenders. It's not just the ones I mentioned. We have hundreds of them. Uh, to get a better idea of which lenders um, are part of this, you can connect with your local SBDC or you can connect with um, the district SBA office. And we have lists of these lenders and how many loans that they give in the area. So the way it works, again, you go to one of these lenders, uh, you would fill out their application for a business loan and give them your business plan. The lender would review your loan application. If they approve it, then they send it electronically to the SBA where we put the guarantee on that loan. Then the lender gives you their money to help you start or expand your business. And you pay the lender back on a month to month basis, usually from seven to 10 years, you have to pay them back, okay? Now, if everything goes smooth, you would not even hear from the SBA. We're sort of in the background. Um, the way we work and the way we help lenders is if for some reason a borrower happens to default on the loan, let's say you got the loan and in, and in two years or three years, something happened to the business and you had to close down. Well, the lender would then come to us, the SBA, and, and uh, uh, let us know the balance that was remaining on the loan. And then the SBA pays that lender up to 80% of the balance of the loan. So that's how we come in is if something happens, okay? So it's actually a very good use of taxpayers' money because if, if everything goes smooth, we just are in the background, but the only time we do come into play is if something happens. So what that does, it reduces the risk to the lender. That's why they're able to give more loans to startup and existing businesses. Okay, so that's very widely used program. A lot of times individuals are even put in this program without really even knowing it because lenders know the value and, and the protection that is within this program. The other loan program we have is pretty much specially for purchasing building or property for your business. So if you're an existing business and you're looking for a building or property, this is a very good program because as the borrower, you only put 10% down and then the SB puts 40% into the venture and then a bank puts the other 50% in and then you pay back the SBA, the 40% over a 25 year period and then the lender uh, uh, the 50% over a 25 per period. So that's a very good program because you as the borrower only has to put in 10% down to purchase a building for your business or property. All right, so the third part of the SBA. So we looked at our, our disaster assistance, our loan program. Now this is the, uh, I call it more the education part. And if, if you're looking at um, the sba.gov website, there's a lot of good self-paced tutorials you can go through from starting um, a business, working on your business plan, marketing strategies, how to get a loan, uh, bookkeeping, learning your financials, a lot of good self-paced tutorials on sba.gov. But I think the biggest value is the funds that we put into the different resource partners that we have, that all of them, as you see here, SBDC, Women's Business Center Score, and the Veteran Business Outreach Center, provide consulting services at no cost to you because it's already paid for by taxpayers' dollars, okay? So that is a big benefit to uh, entrepreneurs, small business owners that need a little bit extra help or, you know, just a second pair of eyes to look over what they're trying to do. 
all those services are at no cost and you can use them as often and as long as you need to help you with um, whatever part of your business you're working on at that time. All of them also provide a lot of good webinars uh, that they um, have every year. So take a look at each one of these services. One thing about Women's Business Center, they, they do a, a lot of classes. So they specialize more in a lot of different webinars and classes. Very good. It is open and equal to all. Men are um, definitely welcome. Matter of fact, when I used to do classes live with them, it's usually 50% men and 50% women. So take, take advantage of those services and classes. Score.org is another good website to look at. They have a lot of good webinars, so take a look at that. The Veteran Business Outreach Center, as the name uh, says, you do have to be a veteran or active military to utilize those services. So I encourage all of you to take a look at those services uh, and, and utilize them. The, the fourth part, and this is the last part here, is government contracting. So if you're currently in business and want to expand your business and, and grow, bring in more profits to your business, uh, selling your product or service to the federal government is a good way to do that. So we do have uh, services at no cost to help you learn about doing that. The SBA does carry the special certifications for the federal. So if you're interested in any of that, please visit our website or you can reach out to me or Mr. Walker at the Reading SBDC and he can tell you more about that. Also, again, you know, we want to let you know about other resources. The state of California has the governor's office of business. We call it Go Biz. Take a look at that because they have new grants that are coming out, new uh, direct loans, uh, through this COVID period. Uh, so there's a lot of good things. I also recommend you connect with your local county, city, the SBDC SCORE Women's Business Center because there's a lot of local grants that are being put out right now. And that's how you can find out about them. Last thing, be careful about fraud or schemes that are going on. Um, that There's an uptick on that. I personally, myself, and we are recommending this, you put a freeze on your credit. Um, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, put a freeze on that. It doesn't cost anything, but it could definitely protect from someone taking your identity and then getting a loan under your name. Um, if you need to give us a call or contact us, this uh, slide here has that information. I will go ahead and turn it over to Dave, um, Mr. Walker, and or the next speakers coming up. Um, and this, all these PowerPoints will be uh, mailed to you if you need to uh, look at them further, or you can contact me. I'm all through, and I'm going to. I will stop sharing my screen so the rest of you can go ahead and uh, take over from here. And I thank you, and I'll be here at the end of the presentation for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we uh, let's see. I do want to tell you that um, if you're one of the unfortunate few who do not live in Shasta or Trinity County, uh, there is an SBDC near you. Uh, there's uh, over, uh, just about a thousand of them ac across the country, so. Uh, you can find them by using that uh, magic website called Google, but at this point. I'd like to introduce Ashley Tate. Uh, Ashley is a strategic communications consultant and a serial entrepreneur, and she also works closely as a business advisor with our SBDC here. So Ashley, uh, it's all yours. And you're muted. And I love virtual. Um, <laughs> thank you everyone for being here today. Um, Yes, David, I, I'm a strategic communications consultant that cannot speak today, but um, I want to introduce the people that we have. If all of you can add your cameras or turn your cameras on, um, we have Heather Helseth, and she is the founder of Renewal Home Decor. And then we have Suzanne Russell, who is the founder of Carousel, Ride Carousel. Um, and you guys can all correct me if I get anything wrong, because you guys are going to introduce yourselves as well. And then we have Dan Morrow, and he is the founder of Soft Tech. And last but not least, we have Che and Tanya, and they are from Moonstone Bistro. 
Um, so anyway, can you guys all, I'm going to start with Che and Tanya Stedman. Can you guys please introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about your businesses and then um, tell us about your business and then we will move on and then I'll start the whole question and answer section. Well, good morning. Thanks for having us. So my name is Che and uh, my wife and I, Tanya, own Moonstone Bistro. Hi. And uh, we, are, we are in the middle of an interesting business climate, I would have to say. So we have uh, we have lots of lots lots of information, uh, probably a few questions, hopefully some answers that might be able to help uh, anyone who is in kind of retail or food service or basically any kind of business that involves contacting people. So um, good service. luck with that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And Suzanne, we'll move on to you. Am I unmuted? I always do this. Yes, you are. <laughs> Hi, I'm Suzanne Russell. Thanks for having me. I own Carousel, which is a clothing boutique downtown Reading. Okay, perfect. And Heather? Hi, I'm Heather Halseth. I'm an interior designer, and um, I also have a, a custom furniture company. And then Dan. Hi, Dan Morrow. I'm founder and chairman of the board of Soft Tech Integrators. Um, we're a Reading-based technology company that helps other companies build factory automation systems. So we help build robots that build things. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so um, let me make sure you guys, okay. So I just wanna make sure I'm actually speaking, you guys can hear me. <laughs> um, so. Anyway, the reason that we're doing this leading in crisis and the reason that we have all of you is because we were hoping to find a breadth of different types of business owners that are leading during this pandemic. And um, as you guys know, living in Shasta County, we've had a few different crises over the past couple of years and we've had to make a lot of different shifts. But this one seems to be one of the most um, impactful to a lot of our business owners here. And so it'll be very interesting to get um, the differences in how, how this has affected all of you. Um, some of the things we really wanna focus on are how you were able to kind of keep your employees or if you had to let your employees go um, and how you've just had to pivot or adjust during this period of time. So I just wanna say a huge thank you to all of you for taking out the time to be here today. So I'm gonna get started. Um, the first thing I wanna let you guys know is if you would like to answer the question that I'm asking, I don't ask it to you directly, um, just please go ahead and chime in, come off mute. I'd love it to be more of a discussion than a direct, I have to ask you a specific question, but I will direct the question to someone first. And then um, if you'd like to add in or add into the discussion, please just take yourself off mute. Um, so, the first question is, how has the pandemic changed the way that you operate? And I know this is a very loaded question, so you can take just one piece or something that you think would be help other business owners to understand. Um, and Dan, I see that you're already off of mute. So if you would like to answer that, um, that would be great. I, I went off mute mainly because I'm in a quiet environment and I always forget that stupid mute button. So Yeah, like I did. That's okay. Well, it's fine. So um, COVID, as I mentioned, we're a techno technology company. Yeah. Uh, I think we kind of had a bit of a head start on a lot of businesses because we were deemed essential and almost all of our customers are not local. So we have been doing remote support, remote work. We've we work with customers that are remote, always have. Um, but the loss of boots on the ground, physical presence, face-to-face -face meetings um, has been a disaster. A lot of what we do is based on um, trust and, and building things and turning wrenches and um, you know, the loss of that piece of human-to-human -human interaction it's just been devastating to our engineering team, to our build team, to our sales team. Um, and from our perspective, it's kind of like, okay, you know, things happen to you or they happen for you. Mm -hmm. So the rules of the game changed and we have been in a nonstop scramble to understand how to move forward and express our value in the market without having 
the advantages of just being able to look somebody square in the eye. It's been a huge challenge. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would agree with that, that that face-to-face -face contact was very difficult to lose um, in a lot of ways. And Dan, how long have you been in business? 20 years. 20 years. Okay. Um, so was this like a, a, a major change? What did what'd you have to do to kind of, you know, make it happen so that you could still accomplish the goal, even though you don't have the human contact piece? Well, you know, every time the rules of the game change, if, if you don't change with it, you're dead. It's just simple as that. So, you know, we've never been afraid of changing how we did it, how we do things. So the first big effort, and like, I don't have answers to this, seriously, don't have answers, oh, yeah, to this, but I'll tell you, we have almost completely revamped our IT infrastructure in the last six months. Everything from the amount of bandwidth we have to where files are located to our telephone system, to our customer management system, to our quoting system, to the way data flows through our materials management, everything to try to accommodate this idea of, of a key employee maybe might not be able to be on site. Paper doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So we've just been in this nonstop change mode trying to find the recipe for how to, how to truly virtualize our workplace. Which is a which brings us to our next question. Really, it's a it's a huge pivot, and I know that um, the rest of you have also had to pivot um, during this period of time. And I'd really like to hear how you kind of got to that pivot mode and what that pivot actually was, and if it's helped or you know hindered you. How have, how has all of this um, made you evolve as a business. And Suzanne and Che, I know for sure you two have had to um, make some major changes. So I'd love to hear from you on that. Suzanne, would you like to take this first? Sure, why not? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, for us, for me in retail, it's already kind of been an, a slow uphill battle um, due to just online shopping. Um, so for me in my small business, I feel like it's all based on relationships. So when I no longer can see people and connect with them, it, it might continue to just be easier to shop online. Um, so one of the ways that we pivoted um, was just doing doorstep delivery. Um, we were kind of letting people shop via text and email and even Zoom a couple of times, and then we would take things um, to them, drop them off. Um, just trying to keep my relationship with people going and try to see them still, even though we kind of weren't allowed to do that. And that's a good point, Suzanne, because I think really it does take, I think that what people are realizing right now is that the relationships are kind of the backbone of your entire business. And so if you were not paying attention to that in the first place, um, I think your business is in a world of hurt because it is true that you can, I think you can translate it to um, Zoom and virtual spaces, but it makes it very difficult to um, connect that way if you haven't already had some sort of connection with them. Right. Um, Jay and Tanya, I'd love to hear uh, from your perspective as well is both from the relational aspect and from the pivot aspect. So uh, the problem that we're having is, is a lot like Suzanne at Carousel in the sense that our business is completely linked to the idea of people communing and it's visceral. So when you shop for a dress or a pair of shoes to not be able to feel the fabric, look at the color with your own eyes, try the pairs of shoes on, actually place the garment on your body. How does it feel, right? It's the same thing with food. The whole idea is, is we are in the service industry. We're not in and out. We don't do fast food. We don't do to go food. Our food isn't designed that way. We have a restaurant that doesn't have microwaves in it. People come in, they're like, can you warm up my coffee? Yes, in a pot, like for three minutes, it's not going to go in a microwave and there's no heat lights. So doing to-go food is not something that we can do to pivot. And I think it's disingenuous for people who are not in the food service industry or in the retail industry to simply come to you and say, why don't you just make your store virtual? Why don't you just do to-go food? Because I'll go bankrupt. Yeah. That's not the model of our business. 
And so that kind of pivot is not something that's actually appreciable. The bottom line is, is you have to crunch the numbers and sometimes you're better off being closed or you have to completely rebuild your basically business plan. Mm -hmm. So in our particular aspect, we have asked the community to help us and invest in a very large outdoor patio, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is we are building an outdoor space that we're going to try to climate control. How do you climate control the outside? How do you cool off 110 degree heat, you know, in the outside? How do you heat it when it's cold? So we, uh, we, we got together with an architect and we're, we're literally investing into our business. Even though we are closed now, our employees know that they have jobs that are rapidly approaching and that we are, we, first let's talk about the question, how do you retain employees, <laughs> right? So I think the number one thing that we did is we literally just sat down with them in our business meetings. So instead of Tanya and I have a meeting with our accountant or with you know Heidi or Michelle at Teamwork HR, we literally sat down with all of them, every single one of them, and laid out the different profit models of, you can have your job for three weeks if we do this before this business permanently closes. You can have your job for six weeks if we do this before this business permanently closes. Or we can go on unemployment for a month and a half while we do this, so that way our jobs remain permanent. And it makes them part of the solution, as opposed to making them question, do I have a job tomorrow? What are we doing? What's going on with my world? Do I need to find another job? Do I need to change my career model? And so by allowing them to be part of that decision, we really haven't lost anyone. We have had to downside a little. Like we had some, we had some employees who were working part time. We did have a, a few full time employees who kind of saw this and, and had other options. But as a general rule, the vast majority of the people who are part of our crew are still part of our crew. So I think you have to create solutions that they see as viable and invite them to be part of it. So that's how we're keeping most of our employees. I think that's a really good point, Jay, and I. I... I also want to bring up something about um, when when COVID first started, I do remember seeing a lot of Facebook posts from you, and I think you really got super involved in trying to help other businesses, even though you had your own business that you had to worry about, um, and just providing information to people about what's out there and what's available. And um, I think that this brought out the leaders in our community, like, tremendously, not only in your business, but also just as a leader, you know, in the community and sharing that information from your, you know, just from learning and sharing that. Um, and then now teaching people how to bring their employees in as a solution and as being part of that solution um, is huge. And I don't think a lot of people think of it that way. I think almost most people are thinking of it like, I don't want my employees to see that I'm struggling or we don't know exactly the right answer and how to make that decision. I, um, yeah, uh -huh, go ahead. So, okay, so I agree with that. And I, I think that that assessment is folly. And I think a lot of employers are trying to hide the fact that this is a difficult time. And yeah. every employee, every single person who's walking the globe right now knows that's not true. Yeah. So okay. to try to pander to them, to be, to be condescending in that respect, yeah. I think is disingenuous, which is why we did the opposite. Now we have plenty of employees who honestly, we don't feel would be great management material or would be able to build a business plan to open up their own business. Not everyone can do that, but you still have to allow them to see the moves that you're making. Transparency right. is really key during this time. None of us really know what we're doing. We're all making it up as we go along. But when they see that you are thinking forward and that you are, um, you know, how much you're going through, first of all, they're glad they're not doing it. <laughs> and um, they, they'll really get behind you, you know, when, when the time comes, which is what we need. We all need our employees to not go someplace else. And that you're actually might be having an issue. Right. right. Yeah. Um, now, okay, so I want to bring Heather in because Heather, you have a, a little bit of a different experience um, in relation to COVID and how it's affected your business. And I think it would be great to kind of share that. So what has kind of been your experience as far as COVID 
um, and how it's affected your business? Um, I, I've been fortunate in that I think um, a lot of my business was originally online with my furniture company um, that was based in San Antonio. It's where I used to live. And so, um, you know, my upholsterers are all there and I ship all over the United States. So I was already set up to work, you know, remotely and I work with customers all over the United States. So that part of the business, you know, stayed the same. Um, and here, you know, locally, um, I've been very busy with fire rebuild, you know, homes, um, custom homes that are being redone um, and also several large remodel projects. Um, I would say we had to adjust, um, you know, doing a lot of, you know, virtual meetings, Zooming, you know, with customers, um, like one um, large remodel project, we do a Zoom uh, every Monday with, you know, the contractor and myself and the homeowner. Um, keeping, you know, track of progress. Um, so I've had to, um, and I was able to bring on someone that does you know, like interior renderings um, and she, you know, has her own business. So she works from home. So I was actually able to expand and, you know, um, subcontract out some of the work. And like I said, she, she also works from home. So yeah. So you've had to take your entire yeah. time virtual because I mean, it would be kind of difficult going into people's homes. Well, you know, you don't really know if they have, you know, any sicknesses or if they've been exposed to COVID. And so, um, yeah, you, whenever you possible, I try and, you know, do virtual, um, you know, occasionally I will go out to job sites, you know, and everyone just wears a mask and, you know, we try and social distance best we can. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm basically they try and eliminate risk where possible and it's not always possible in the construction process. I mean, sometimes I've FaceTime with the contractor who's there on the job site and, you know, to go over details. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it definitely, I've had to, you know, figure out ways to do things remotely. Like I said, some of it already was doing remotely and then other things I've had to adjust, you know, more locally. I would say one thing that I've really seen is in the like supply chain has really been disturbed, you know, with COVID. So for instance, for me, I use um, summer vintage, like for instance, chair frames. I do a lot of uh, custom chairs where we take vintage frames and completely gut and redo them and really customize it for the customers. Um, but I also use an American hardwood uh, frame company uh, for furniture. And so I've had several times where, you know, for what the company was shut down because of COVID, you know, they don't have their workers in there making the frames. So there's, you know, and sometimes where, you know, business has been lost because I can't get the frame, you know, that the customer is wanting. It's just not available. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, have any of you, all out of all the changes and all the pivots that you guys have had to make, have there been any silver linings from this that you've seen, like something, a sort of change that you might want to keep permanently or any changes that you're just going to do temporarily um, and you want to really get back to something like I know Che and Tanya, for sure, you guys are going to go back to having people come into your restaurant and eating your spectacular food. Um, but are there any changes that you are going to keep? You know, Suzanne, I know that you're you're doing more of the mobile side, and Dan, you've had to do more virtual meetings. Um, are there any things that you guys are actually going to keep or or get rid of when you when things return to normal, if they return to normal? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. So, for Thanks. us, our, our restaurant has always been kind of small and and tight, cozy, mm -hmm. uh, and due to COVID, we've we've had to remove tables and chairs, which is a hit on income, true. But the spacing that is like now it. in between our tables <laughs> makes our guests feel much more comfortable and much more private. So, so our little tiny restaurant, which used to be, you know, kind of, kind of raucous, yeah. is now much more intimate. And because we can seat outside, because we're building a patio, because everything now, you know, our landlord is very aware of space requirements in order for restaurants to be open as well as other retail shops. I'm not sure if it's going to affect rent prices 
because we pay by the square foot. So you want to maximize the money that you make per square foot. Mm -hmm. But that being said, we have a good relationship with our landlord. So we are going to be able to keep the distance yeah. between yeah. tables and chairs and still have a viable, profitable business once the patio is built and we start moving more towards a, you know, a normal functioning society. I am curious as to how someone like Suzanne would be able to do that when you know your clothes take up the space and your customers work in between them. So that might be a little bit of a different model. So yeah, that, Suzanne, what do that, you think that's a different title. Yeah, for oh. us with the space, you know, they they say uh, retails at twenty percent capacity right now, and. I've been lower than that all year because we're not getting like the, what I call random foot traffic of just people, hey, I'm out downtown walking around and I'm gonna go swing into this store. It's been very intentional. My customers have been very intentional this year. If they shop at Carousel, they're still shopping at Carousel. Um, and as far as, I mean, I have 1500 square feet, so, I've been able to keep it at about five people all year, except for on Small Business Saturday. That was uh, that was the most people I've seen all year, which really made it was just a great great day to see people out and intentionally shopping local. But as far as the pivots that we've had to make, that I will keep. Um, Private shopping appointments have been really good, and that is something that um, we we made a shoppable website in 72 hours when this first happened. And one of the things that we put on there was a an appointment calendar. So now people, if they don't want to come in and be around others, they can go online, book an appointment, and I show up, and they can shop by themselves. So that's been a really great uh, pivot for us that we'll keep. And the other is the pony parcels that we started. So it's basically like a local stitch fix. And we send people boxes uh, every other week, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, however often they want it. And they can just send back what they don't want. And I have a card on file and we just charge the card on file. So those are things that have enhanced, I think, our specialty. Um, and people have liked it. So we'll keep those going. Well, I want to hear more about the pony parcels <laughs> after this. <laughs> I love that idea. That's, that's perfect. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, gosh, it's so amazing how you can, how you can change so quickly, like 72 hours to get a website up is amazing <laughs> that people can shop. Oh, uh, I have a great husband. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's amazing. Um, Dan, are there any things that you're going to end up keeping or getting rid of um, that you've had to change during during this period of time? So let me divide this into two parts. Okay. From, from the business perspective, you know, that that is changes a way of life. Yes. And we'll keep everything that we're doing. We wouldn't do it if we didn't want to keep it. Okay. Right. And, you know, Suzanne, that was brilliant. That's exactly right. I wish, I wish businesses would do more of that. I hate waiting in lines. Just tell me when I can come in. It would be great. I love it. Suzanne, well done. You know, that, that's exactly what we do. On a personal side, all right, so my takeaway, um, you know, uh, David's on the call. He talked about the SBA stuff. Over the years, I've done four of the F SBA programs, right? And every time uh, I went to do one of those things, I had to have a friend. And it's guys like David, and, you know, and that you have to know before you start the process, right? Because when an opportunity comes, you know, to be able to fund that kind of stuff, you, you just need to have a pool of friends. Um, in this instance, with the whole COVID thing, what stuck in my craw from day one was the definition of essential. I mean, somebody somewhere thought some of my people were not essential. They vehemently disagreed with that assessment. And so for me personally, um, my takeaway from this period of time is I need to spend a lot more attention communicating 
just how complicated our business environment is, how inter intertwined we all are, that there's nobody here. If you're not essential, you're not in business, right? That's, that's the nut of it is we can't make a living if we're not essential. That's, I mean, that is a definition. So um, I'm looking, I, I personally need to find my feet in adventures like uh, this one today in the chamber. Somehow I need to get down and figure out how to, to influence the thinking of our state um, so that when they approach small business, they understand how precarious, how finely tuned our business models are and how a real simple statement like, well, let's just close for a couple of weeks is catastrophic to so many of us. And I, 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 I really wish this had been done differently, but I, I think I own some of that. And so my takeaway on this is I got to find a way to have a better voice or to, to clarify our situation, at least my situation uh, going forward. So I, I'm, I'm really having a serious look at the advocacy part of this whole adventure going forward. And I, I think that's actually huge. And, and that was one of the things that I was referring to when I was talking about, you know, Chase starting that early on, um, not just thinking about your own business because, you know, um, they really didn't, small businesses didn't really have a voice to be no. honest, you know, um, and, and that's why a lot of us are in the position that we're in right now. And as you guys know, the SBDC does work with small businesses and there are a lot of um, small businesses in Shasta County that do receive help from the SBDC. And one of the things that I would like to kind of close on or wrap up, whatever you guys want to call it, um, is start a discussion on how can, how can small businesses who may be watching this on the replay or currently, what advice would you give them? And I have a couple of different questions, so you can choose one that you would like to answer, but what advice would you give on how to pivot? What advice would you give on keeping or, um, or trying to work with your employees and your human resources? Um, and then what are some things that you realized weren't as hard as you thought they were going to be um, and actually made your life a little bit easier having to make these changes during COVID? I know that was a lot. Just choose anyone you'd like and um, give some advice on that. So just uh, two sentences. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> first thing that happened when the COVID shut down is our t sales team got on the phone and we called every customer we had. We said, look, here's the world <clears throat> as it is today. The rules all change. What can we do for you to make you successful? I love that. And it was, it was really about us trying to figure out how we could use what we have to express value in our customer's world. And then we just drove the bus under it. That's great. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, Heather? I mean, I would say for me, it's been, um, it's been a good learning. I've always been a sole proprietor. Um, and so now being able to, you know, take on, I have subcontractors that I work with, you know, um, but being able to delegate some of my workload um, to, you know, I have an assistant, like I said, that does the rendering now. So that helps delegate my workload and, you know, frees me up. So it's kind of, this has helped kind of force me to learn to delegate more. So I think that's, you know, been really great, you know, and especially, you know, I have a a high schooler, a freshman, you know, so on top of everything else, I'm been homeschooling since March. <laughs> not so, so fun, right? <laughs> no, yeah, I'm not really loving it at all. So yeah, I'm really ready for that to go back to normal. <laughs> but I do love, I want to just say one thing too, that you just mentioned, um, when you were talking about your assistant and, and the other person who, um, also had a business and you started working with them. I think people forget that those partnerships are huge because now you're spreading the business that you get with someone else and helping their business as well. And I think if people could reach out and kind of do that with each other, um, that's, that's huge. Uh, and I yeah, also, definitely. what was that? I said, yes, definitely. I mean, the, the networking, 
you know, I mean, my chair business alone, I have, you know, um, two independent shippers, you know, I use white glove delivery. So I have two guys that, you know, drive all over the nation delivering, yeah. um, you know, they're their own businesses. You know, I have an upholster in San Antonio. I have an upholster here, you know, so just off the top of my head, there's four right there, you know, and then, yeah. um, I'm also, I share a creative office space with Suzanne's husband, uh, Ryan Russell in Rad Studio. So we're all in a, you know, collaborative creative space. And so we work, you know, really well together on projects. That, that's some of the silver lining. Um, Suzanne? Uh, I love what Dan said about being, you know, essential or non-essential. I think it's so easy for people to look at whatever business they're looking at and think, you know, in my case, oh, it's just a clothing store. It doesn't, you know, you can just be closed. It's fine. Um, well, when we closed, we missed an entire season. Um, our inventory is really specialized. So a lot of the things that I have in my store are made in LA, not mass produced in China. Um, so for us, you know, i I think if you're passionate about it, you will figure it out. I've worked harder this year than I have in many years prior. Um, and also just the whole relationship aspect of my business. I, I now more than ever feel like it's, it's about people. It's not really about the clothes. Um, and that is enough to, you know, make me do whatever I need to do for ensuring this business stays open in Reading. Yeah. And I think for, for Suzanne, and I can say for sure with Che and Tanya, um, probably also you, Heather, um, Dan, I know you're a little bit more uh, distanced from the actual, you know, population. We don't always see everything that you do, but I can say for sure with the three of you businesses, um, the community really did come together to whether they needed your services Heather, in your case for interior design, a lot of people were just home and they were like, I need, I need to do something with my home. Um, and then Suzanne also, you know, your, your clothes, your boutique, I know that people may not think it's essential, but for a lot of women during this period, yeah, we were take editing our closets and, you know, kind of going back in to kind of see what we need and, and shopping. And that's kind of really all people had time to do. And Che and Tanya, I mean, you guys have, I think, the the best example of what the community can do uh, for a business that they they really want to see make it. Um, and you guys are going to come out on top in the end. I mean, almost like gangbusters in the end. I feel like. Um, and so it really is kind of a transformational process for all of us this year. I know a lot of people have looked at it like doom and gloom, but I think it's really been a transformational year. Um, so Che and Tanya, not to take over your, your area, I want to know what kind of what you think um, and what advice you would give to especially people in the community. More than anything, I think that you just have to not quit. Whatever, you know, during the recession, literally at one point, we, our, our motto was, hey, the key works, guess we're still in business. <laughs> and it's been like that a couple of times, more than once this year. You know, where we're, we just, as long as you just don't quit and you just, we all have to just come out on the other side of this. And that path is not always clear, but as long as you just one foot in front of the other, just keep waking up and every day, you know, make, adapt and, and just make the changes that you need to do to come through on the other side. Um, I think that's that's a real important thing. Yeah, for everyone. So I have, I have two things and both of them have to do with adapting your business. Uh, Basically, you know, people are saying that you, you can switch or, you know, try to come up with a, a new business model. And there's two things about that that people need to take away. Number one, run the numbers. Mm -hmm. This is a business. It's not a game. And you can't just wake up and be like, oh, I'm going to start a new business today from my old business. A lot of people are going to fail because of that. And that's one of the things that I said from the very, very beginning in my Facebook posts is if you own a business and you are trying to pivot, you had better run the numbers first. You may find it is less expensive for you to simply close than to try to change your model and run yourself into the dirt. Yeah. Two, in our business, if we were to say pivot to to-go food, 
think about what we're really saying. What we're really saying is half of our employees have jobs and half of them don't. So the entire front of the house are suddenly unemployed, but the back of the house is. And when you put that kind of statement out, oh, we're just gonna do to-go food, you are punishing, you are excluding mm -hmm. half of your team. And that is extraordinarily detrimental. So we are a crew and a team, and we are going to collectively come through this as a business. We are not going to pick and choose. So that kind of messaging resonates with your crew, the people who rely on you to pay your rent. So be careful. The other thing I wanted to add to that, Shay, that you said earlier um, is I think what it made everyone else do as well is kind of look at your business and really understand what type of business you, you want to run or what type of business you want to have. And I thought it was a really key point when you said um, that basically we don't, we don't do to go food. Like every, we don't have heat lamps, we don't have microwaves. I, I love that because that's part of the reason that people go to Moonstone, right? Like you want fresh food, you wanna eat whatever Che is going to make that day. And I'm sure you have other people cooking for you too. <laughs> But, you know, it's like you knew your business model and you knew exactly what it was that you do and you were not willing to sacrifice that to change, you know, and sometimes that is a key piece of, of this period as well. Look at your numbers, but also realize what you're willing to sacrifice um, and what you're not. And that's okay too. So anyway, I think you guys all had amazing information for these businesses. I think anybody watching this will get a ton of information um, we have so many different industries here, uh, retail, um, gosh, um, shipping, <laughs> if I can call that shipping and manufacturing, um, restauranteurs and tech. Uh, there's just so many different ways to look at this. And I, I applaud you all for, for making it through. You guys have done an amazing job. Um, the pivots that you guys have done, I mean, I love it. Suzanne, I want that pony pony box, whatever you call it. I want one of those. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, David, if you would like to take over, you can. And I just want to say thank you again to all of you. Um, some great, great advice, great information. And thank you for sharing. Yes. And thank you from me as well. Heather, Dan, Che and Tanya, Suzanne, Ashley. Terrific job. Thank you. It's very interesting. And Che and Tanya, I can't wait till you get that patio done. I'm getting used to the sharp turn out of the Starbucks drive through now. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be nice. And I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, sitting yeah. outside. Yes, we are. We are working on the construction. We're going to widen that drive through <laughs> a little bit as a matter of fact. <laughs> wow. Hey, God bless America. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so anyway, uh, I put a uh, link to a uh, survey. Uh, we uh, really do appreciate your feedback. We'd like to know what you think about this. We have thick skin, so t be honest and let us know how we can improve. Uh, you're also, everybody will receive an email with the slides from uh, Mr. Castaneda's presentation earlier and with uh, a copy of the link as well. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you again to the panelists. This was terrific. And uh, there, there is a recording of this and un unless I get slapped with a lawsuit or hear something horrible, I think we're going to go ahead and put it on our YouTube channel and we'll send you a link to that as well. So take care, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Sure. Thank you, David.